we've got an exciting agenda today. We have two folk, two teams here uh, to present. Uh, this is uh, the mid-month meeting of TAG Observability. It's a CNCF-related event. Uh, as such, the Code of Conduct does apply. Uh, please don't do anything that would be in violation of that code. And again, apart, apologies for being a little tardy. Uh, let's just uh, start right away at the top of the agenda. Yeah, so I actually put it, put, put my point should be very quick. So I wanted to announce that um, we kind of organize, um, there was an opportunity to organize uh, project specific meetings at the next KubeCon in Europe, in Valencia, which is in May. And uh, we had opportunity to create uh, some kind of time for dedicated for our tag meeting. So um, it's kind of opportunity to meet everyone who will join KubeCon in Europe. So I just wanted to announce that it will be around 11 a.m. on Monday. Um, I believe so on Monday. It's kind of double check. 17th May is on Monday. Yeah, probably. Um, but essentially, we have like dedicated two hours to um, to speak about anything. Just meet each other, and uh, if we need any special, I don't know, equipment or anything, uh, let me know. And also, we probably want to decide if we want to make it like only in person, or do we want to maybe. Uh, sync and have like a virtual conference as well like together with in person we can do that as well we have a you know projector we have we have equipment so um, also we should probably build some agenda uh, so that's what I wanted to announce any questions any proposals any ideas It's actually 16th of May, yeah, it's Monday. All right, if nothing, uh, no, no other comments, then I guess we can go to another agenda item, which is uh, Hubble project presentation. Hey folks, uh, this is Thomas. I'll talk about Cilium and Hubble today and briefly introduce it. Let me start sharing here. I only very minimal number of slides here, but I think it will help a little bit. Um, my name is Thomas. I'm a co-founder of Isovate and also one of the creators of Cilium. And Cilium is essentially the, the base project or the, the, the overall project and Hubble, the observability layer of Cilium is what we're talking about today. Cilium itself is a CNTF project at incubation level. So if we're talking about like Cilium and eBPF, those are open source projects. Um, I'm also creator or, or founder of Isovalent, the company behind Cilium um, and Hubble. What is Cilium? Cilium is actually a lot more than observability, but today we will talk about the observability layer which is called Hubble. Overall, Cilium also provides networking, load balancing, Cilium is a CNI, Cilium can do service mesh, Cilium can do a lot of network security and also runtime security. But what's interesting today is this observability layer. We can provide Prometheus metrics, extensive flow loading, open telemetry output, and service dependency graphs. What is unique about Cilium is that Cilium itself has been entirely based on EBPF. Uh, and uses eBPF to its full extent. In fact, we have extended eBPF for the first two years before we have even started the Cilium project. So let's talk uh, briefly and look into this eBPF technology for those of you who have never heard about it. eBPF is actually very, very simple to understand. It makes the Linux kernel programmable, essentially allowing to run a program such as this one, this is C code, um, but it's also possible to write this in higher level languages to run a program when certain events in the kernel happen. In this case, we're using a system call, but this could also be a network packet, a storage access, a function call of a user space, user space application, a kernel trace point, and so on. And we can then use that program to actually extract visibility. Uh, the program I'm showing here is actually called on every time the exact system call is being made. For example, when somebody invokes a new uh, command on the shell, and we can then uh, export st statistics like CPU, uh, what is the PID, what is the UID, and so on. This is allowing us to build flame graphs and uh, get a lot of additional visibility. 
What is very unique about eBPF is that it is essentially a general purpose or almost general purpose uh, runtime. So it's very, very similar to JavaScript in the browser, but for the Linux kernel. So we can load bytecode um, into the Linux kernel and essentially run them. And that means we can all of a sudden essentially add functionality to the Linux kernel that was not there before. So we can add uh, tracing, observability functionality, we can parse HTTP headers, we can uh, parse network headers, we can collect histograms of any sort we want without making the Linux kernel itself, without actually making kernel source code changes or changes that would previously have required source code changes. I'm, show, I'm showing one example here where we, where we can kind of make the impact of this so obvious. This is a quick benchmark of how effective, how efficient EBPF-based visibility can be. In this case, we're showing the difference between a proxy or a sidecar-based HTTP visibility attempt, which is the yellow one for injecting proxies, um, and an EBPF-based one, which is the red one. And the baseline here, essentially, just the benchmark itself um, is, is the blue bar. This is showing, in particular, at higher requests per second, how minimal the EBPF overhead is to, for example, provide HTTP visibility. It's just one of the examples, but this is essentially true across the line that eBPF is both powerful and super low overhead, which is an ideal combination in the observability space. Overall, what eBPF is allowing is actually much bigger because the kernel is actually a super powerful place to extract visibility because the kernel can see everything, but it has been very hard to get kernel changes into the hands of end users. I've been kernel developer for more than 10, for more than 10 years at Red Hat. And it usually took years and years and years for a new kernel version to make it into the hands of end users, which made it very difficult to extend or build new functionality into the kernel and get that out to users quickly. eBPF is changing this because all of a sudden we can make changes in real time or like at any moment and just run them, load the programs and run them. So this has allowed for a very similar innovation as when JavaScript was added to browsers, because all of a sudden we don't need to upgrade our browsers anymore just to load a new website, which was clearly the case 20 years ago where we had to upgrade our browsers frequently. So that's a power of eBPF. We'll skip the rest of here and go into Hubble. So Hubble provides a lot of different things. Um, it provides this visibility on the left that we'll have to look into that briefly. Uh, it provides metrics, Prometheus metrics, but they can also be exported into an SIM, Splunk, Elasticsearch or something. And then also network tap uh, or essentially distributed PCAP as well, where you can actually get real copies of the, of the, of the network traffic that you're seeing. This is the example I'm showing here in terms of how we have, how Hubble is evolving network flow visibility. For the networking folks of you, this is an AWS flow lock, but it, it, it represents any five tuple based uh, logging. It's essentially this IP is talking to this IP, number of pipes, number of packets, and so on. Not really useful in the context of containers and Kubernetes and cloud native. This is the visibility that we provide, which at the first glance doesn't even show or look like a network flow log. What actually shows you um, not only the, the, now, the, the Kubernetes namespace, the pod, the entire process ancestry tree, who is invoking what, we can see that like, Docker D is the runtime here, it's spawned by system D. Then we see a crawler binary, which is running containerized. Then we see that this crawler binary is invoking node app. And then surprise, surprise, there was actually compromised app here. We see that a reverse shell was used to reach out of the cluster apparently received instructions, then an attacker was using curl to look around. And we see the actual network connections um, in the, as, as arrows here with the destinations they've reached out. And we see that both the actual workload is talking to our Elasticsearch uh, server in here, but then also the attacker attempted um, to reach out to that. We can even say that see the layer seven observability data here that we're actually have observed an HTTP get to slash user slash search. So very, very powerful visibility because EBPF can see everything from the network layer to the runtime layer and so on. But let's switch over to a live demo where we actually see kind of what type of visibility that we can provide on top of this. So let me switch my screen here and show you a couple of the, the metrics um, that we can generate. You should be seeing my Grafana dashboard right now, is that correct? 
yeah i hope excellent so there's a ton of dashboards that you can build um i'm showing a few of them right now so obviously we can look at kind of the raw network level so this is prometheus exports um with just a grafana standard grafana dashboard we can export the same metrics as open telemetry uh, metrics as well or any format that you really want so we can see for example for water versus dropped we can see that a certain amount of traffic is constantly being dropped because of policy deny reasons we can, for example looking to the network layer we see what type of tcp events are ongoing we see how many TCP sins are being sent without being responded to. So this is essentially a graph that shows you how many connection timeouts or how many connections are timing out. Uh, we can see why packets are being denied. We can see, let's go into the HTTP layer. So we can observe the entire HTTP traffic that we're seeing. And all of this obviously completely transparently. So no changes to apps or anything like this. You can deploy this as a daemon set into your cluster and essentially transparently get these metrics out. Um, for example, what type of HTTP traffic what type of responses we're not getting any 404s right now which is good latency of just graphing p50 p99 here uh, then dns probably the most um favored dashboard by platform teams and also app teams we can see what type of dns requests what type of dns responses how many errors what are the pods currently receiving dns uh, errors so this is <laughs> what people look at very very quickly because dns is the source of issues so many times but then also, um, what are the DNS queries that are actually being done? So that's kind of the network view of things. Um, let's also quickly look into, for example, a bit more advanced metrics. So we could, for example, actually hook into the TCP layer and graph out the smooth and round trip time of all TCP connections. We can look into what pod is consuming how much or producing how much traffic. So we can see, for example, what's the max um, traffic per pod here, and this is, um, a service called Node Exporter which is essentially at max pumping out 70 max per second. You can also look at the average and we see that the Hubble timescape in Chester is averaging the most traffic. You can, for example, look at how much traffic for each pod. Um, we can then look at the binary level. So not just at the pod level, but actually look into which binary inside what pod is consuming or producing how much traffic, uh, which also gives us, for example, we can look at kubelet, right? Not just actually containerized or pod level traffic, but also kubelet. So this is the amount of network traffic that kubelet is producing or um, receiving. We can look at DNS, DNS destinations traffic. We can look at how many, how much traffic in between pods. We can see which pods are doing TCP retransmissions. You can see that there is the source controller, which is talking to github.com frequently. And apparently that is receiving or doing TCP ret retransmissions occasionally. So lots of different visibility. Uh, we can even go into, let's say, lower level metrics. So this is the, these are the network interface statistics. So you can actually see which node is pumping out or receiving how much traffic per interface, are there uh, interface, uh, uh, interface errors, and so on. So a massive amount of statistics and visibility that we can explore. So to kind of summarize, I know this was a quick intro. To kind of summarize, Hubble is the observability layer of Cilium all EDPF based. It provides Prometheus metrics from like lower network levels all the way into layer seven, HTTP, Kafka, DNS, and so on. Um, you can use it from like platform team levels or kind of security metrics, network policy, all the way into building golden signal dashboards. Because it's using EDPF, it's completely transparent and it's part of the Solim project, which is a CNCF project at integration level. I hope this was a good first initial intro into Hubble. If you are interested in it and want to learn more, feel free to go to Cilium.io uh, or join our Slack. Lots of people are happy to answer questions there. You can obviously also DM me uh, on Twitter or on Slack, and I'm happy to answer questions as well. Do we have time for questions or should we move on? No, we, we absolutely do. Thank you right. so much. Um, uh, if you could also, after, uh, put a link to the slides that you presented as absolutely. well. The, into the doc uh, downstream, but there is a question here from Dan. Uh, I think he's still here, so I could ask, let him ask it. Uh, yeah, uh, great presentation. We're actually exploring adopting a mesh right now. And, and the key uh, thing that's been murky to me is like, how do I actually enrich my metrics? Um, so this was a great presentation. Can you go into a little bit of detail uh, on on how that actually works. What am I right? Let's say I have a metric X that I want to tag 
um, we do like ownership driven tagging. Um, so I want to say like this team owns this metric uh, mm -hmm. through the sidecar. How do I achieve that? Yeah. So I think a wonderful part of us is that Solium achieves all this visibility without sidecar. So when we actually talk about service mesh, we're not talking the sidecar model. We're talking sidecar three service mesh model. That's entirely eBPF and Envoy driven, but without sidecars. From a, from a label perspective and from an observability perspective, we have programmable metrics, which means you can actually add as much context to every Prometheus metrics that you want. So you can add namespace or labels or whatever. And then we actually have our back functionality where based on those labels, you can then restrict who is seeing what metric. So you can, for example, have a Prometheus scraping endpoint that only shows the metric of one particular namespace and then actually have like a dashboard that's specific to a team that only sees that namespace as well. Does that make sense? So we can actually RBAC or scope with RBAC rules every metric and bound that to, for example, pod labels or a namespace name or some other identification that we can retrieve. So essentially you can, you can enrich Prometheus metrics with as much metadata as you want. That's completely, completely programmable. Uh, what is it programmable via? So there's a, there's a static configuration, then Golang as well. So if, like a lot of can be done in static configuration. Um, CR, CRD base, and then you go, I want to, want to go further. There's essentially a go plugin layer that allows you to even create more metrics or aggregate them or put them or use a different aggregation form and so on. Did that answer the question? I hope so. Hmm. Uh, there was also, uh, did, uh, I'm not sure if that did that answer the question for, for you, Dan. He, he may have dropped because he, he froze. Oh, he did drop. Well, uh, the other half of his question that he had put in the, in the doc was, could you please elaborate on the relationship between Hubble and Cilium? Yes. So projects? they're both, they're tied to each other. So right now you cannot use Hubble without Cilium, but you don't have to use Cilium as your primary CNI to observe and use Hubble. But essentially Hubble bases itself on top of Cilium and uses Cilium as its eBPF base infrastructure. So you, you're not required to migrate to Cilium as a CNI, but you are required to also run Cilium as a daemon set to load eBPF programs and have the base functionality around. Does that make sense? Uh, Tom, can I ask a question? I recently met with uh, our director of network and what you just uh, showed is exactly what he's looking for, where mostly AWS shop and he's desperate to find something that will show all dependency between all these network uh, pieces. So I'm just curious, it's not just about Kubernetes in general, Kubernetes is just part of this game. So how exactly you extract this data? Is it just using um, just a simple Grafana slash AWS interface or using you extract this data? by using any AWS Prometheus uh, exporters and later you're working with this data. Yeah, so we have for metrics, we have um, Prometheus and open telemetry support for flow logging. That's essentially event-based, like we're seeing this connection, this connection, this connection. It's JSON and we have a Fluent D plugin, so you can export this into whatever system you want. And then we also have um, um, a timescape-based time series database where you can actually store this persistently in your own Kubernetes cluster as well. And then we also have Hubble UI, which is a service dependency graph that ingests the, the flow data and the metric data and shows that. So that's, um, that can, for example, show you a service dependency graph, who's depending on what. But you can also achieve that with the open telemetry export if you're using something like Jaeger or another UI that can show you the, the, the um, dependency. Just to say, uh, I'm using FluentZ anywhere to push this data to look at, right? Yeah. So let's say if I'm just going, as I understand you, I just have to push this to another uh, plugin, your plugin, and you would take care of this one. You would uh, build that in all the subjects. This is what you uh, would just, okay. Exactly, yes. Okay. So, but this is uh, only what could be discovered and uh, make a relation map inside of a Kubernetes server itself. Mm -hmm. but, uh, no. You can also run Cilium on any Linux machine. And in, in EVPF has recently been ported over to Windows as well, but right now Cilium, is, uh, or Cilium on Windows is still in kind of, in kind of an alpha level, but you can run Cilium on any machine you want. It's not actually Kubernetes specific. If there are no Kubernetes parts, it will simply report the raw processes. 
Okay. So can I ask you to do me a favor and send this information, share this information so we can Sure, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, we'll, we'll we'll have all uh, all links and everything can be. Okay. I can I can send out a blast to the email list as well. Um, I think Eric had one question as well. Um, uh, I think he's still online. Yeah, I, so I I actually have a lot of questions, <laughs> but um, my most basic one is with all of those statistics running, what kind of overhead does that take? Because I know that you showed that one graph that showed you know the more requests you had, the it was just a tiny overhead, but you're gathering a ton of information across a lot of different network interfaces. Yeah. So I think the, the massive benefit of eBPF is that all of this histogram collection, which in the past you used to do kind of export a lot of samples from kernel to user space and then aggregate and collect the histograms in user space, all of that is now done in kernel, which is very effective. So the real overhead actually comes at the level of Prometheus and so on, like Prometheus memory. This is where you think about like um, label complexity and how much data to have. The actual collection of the mesh itself is incredibly low overhead. So even with like, very extensive configurations, it's somewhere in the five to 20% overhead. It will depend a little bit on how many HTTP requests per second, for example, you have, or if you have lots of low level UDP connections and you're looking at every packet, lots of things can be configured, but the actual collection layer is incredibly efficient. Usually the overhead or the bottleneck is things like JSON encoding or how, 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 Prometheus, how much memory um, the actual Prometheus instance will use and so on. So, so you're saying five to twenty percent, including Prometheus, or is that for the collection part? That's on the that's on collection on the node. Prometheus overhead is a bit hard to measure because it's usually not per node, right? Like that's it also. I mean, with, with with Prometheus, it's usually like the 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 total complexity you have, how many labels and so on, uh, will dictate how much memory you will use there. And all of your graphs I saw were look like they're network based. Is it? Do you also do CPU utilization as well? Yeah, well, or, I mean. Is that we built have, in? We have dashboards. We show that as well. We're not, we're, but then we're just using existing CPU collection. Like we haven't written a new collector for CPU stats. We're just using. Okay. Them. What about like different accelerators besides networks? So there's, you know, like GPU, there's these encryption accelerators. There's all these different things out there. Or are you focused mostly on just the networking part? I mean, we have started out with networking only. Now we've added this process context as well, and we're now expanding. Um, right now, we're essentially very network heavy, very connectivity heavy. Okay, and and do do you support? Are you adding all the EBF byte code yourself, or is there like a module? Is it modular where people, let's just say, they wanted to add something into the Hubble project? Do they do that themselves? Is that something you support, or do do they have to contribute that upstream, or how does that process work? It, you, there was, you would have to change Hubble slash Cilium code base codes to change the EBPF program. So yes, yeah, Cilium loads the EBPF programs. Um, there is no pluggable infrastructure right now where a user could, could add raw EBPF programs. That could definitely be done and added, but that doesn't exist right now. And kind of a really basic question. I didn't really understand what's the difference between Hubble and Cilium? Like what does Cilium do and, and what does Hubble do? Like where, where are their lines at? As far so Cilium is the overall project, which also includes like network routing, load balancing, network security, enforcement, all of that. And Hubble is the observability part. Of oh, this. okay, okay, got it. Thanks. If I could kind of tack on to that last question, partially as a segue, but also because we ask it for a lot of the folks to come present. Um, you know, how could could you provide either in the doc or uh, provide a short overview of how someone might engage with the the project of Cilium Hubble, uh, all of it. Uh, if they wanted to contribute or had ideas to make it better? Where would they start? And what's the community and governance model uh, like uh, pragmatically? So absolutely, so as I mentioned, Cilium and Hubble is part of Cilium. Cilium is a CNTF project. Uh, GitHub is github.com slash Cilium slash Cilium. Uh, you will find pointers to Hubble there. The best community entry point is Cilium.io, which will point you to the Slack channel we have. Of about 10,000 people, there's a development channel there. So all the development is happening in roadmap planning. All of that is happening on GitHub and Slack. Uh, and you'll find all of those pointers on Cilium.io. Awesome, thank you very much. Um, if there, <laughs> are there any other, and thanks, thanks again for, for presenting. Um, uh, this, is, this is really cool. Um, uh, are there any other questions before we move on to the next presenter, uh, to Pixie? Okay. Um, well, th thank you very much. If there, are, if there, if there are further questions for for uh, Thomas or the the Hubble uh, team, uh, feel free to use our Slack channels or mailing list uh, or 
uh, other means. But um, thank you again. We've got Zane and Michelle. Hey, um, I don't know how you're doing. hey everyone. Uh, I'm Zane. Hopefully, can you hear me? Yeah, there's a little echo, but we can hear. Okay, sorry about that. Is it, oh, you know why? Uh, it's probably in broadcasting from two devices. Uh, is it any better now? Uh, no, but we can totally hear you. It's totally fine. Okay, great. So I wanted to give a little quick update on the Pixie project. Uh, Matt, Matt asked us to uh, do a quick cast on that. Um, so let me pull up the slides real quick. There are a few slides and then a quick demo. So for people that are not familiar with Pixie, uh, we are currently a sandbox CNCF project um, that uses eBPF to enable a bunch of different observability use cases, specifically on Kubernetes. So there's definitely some overlap with what you saw with Hubble, uh, but we have a slightly different approach to it. And you know, Thomas and I, uh, we, we know each other, we're, uh, we're together on a bunch of things. So anyways, without further ado, um, what is Pixie? Pixie is a developer debugging platform with the goal of providing out of box visibility for your Kubernetes cluster. Um, so once you get a Pixie installed, uh, without having to modify anything in your cluster, you'll get a bunch of different uh, pieces of information, things like service health, uh, logging, request tracing, uh, Kafka, and a bunch of different things out of the box. And all of this is done pretty transparently um, using eBPF. And you can check out our website, like ps.dev, for a lot more of the technical details. Um, so we kind of were built on like three different, you know, high level principles. Uh, the first one being is everything is code driven on the fly and no manual instrumentation collection. So uh, Pixie uses uh, this language called Pixel, which is basically, you know, Pandas Python dialect. Uh, it allows you to go and like process and build data processing pipelines for for data. Uh, we split our storage between Edge and Cloud. Um, so the high level goal over here is that we can collect a ton of data using UPF, and we want to make sure that we can efficiently store it. So most of the data is actually stored on the node until we need to like egress it out or someone access to it. Um, and then third thing is everything's API driven. So you can basically go and access all of the data available through Pixie into an API to go enable other tools. Uh, for example, there is a Pixie you know, Grafana plugin using, using the Pixie API. Um, oh, oh, I'm sorry, one more thing. What's new? Um, so I'll kind of walk through the entire thing because I'm not sure how, ever, how familiar everyone is, but what's specifically new in Pixie, what people have been following Pixie, is that we now have uh, continuous profiling and plain graphs for Java programs. Um, we have you know, support for Node.js and OpenSSL tracing uh, for requests. Uh, Kafka tracing and a bunch of other other minor things. Um, so I'll actually just go through and do a, a quick overview demo of Pixie, along with you know show off a couple of the new features like Java continuous profiling and Kafka. So if you're over here, um, this is the main Pixie UI. So once you you know get into Pixie, you can get a very high level overview of all the HTTP requests that are going on in your cluster and what is their you know throughput. Um, you know, latency and, and, you know, other information like error rates uh, based on like, you know, different services. So there's actually a load generator running, it's making a bunch of requests, which then causes a bunch of downstream requests to happen. Um, so remember all this happens as soon as you install Pixie, which takes about, you know, two, three minutes, depending on how Kubernetes is feeling at that moment in time. Um, but after that, we instrument everything using eBPF, so you don't have to do any additional work. Um, we can dive in to um, more details over here. So for example, um, I can dive into this online boutique pod and you can see like specifically for this namespace PS online boutique, where the requests happening, what are the slow requests, where are the ranges of requests that we're seeing. Um, if we specifically click into a service, let's say I want to see what the checkout service is doing. Um, I can get a more you know, granular overview of the HTTP requests, errors, latencies, um, I can see what a sample of all the slow requests are. So if I click on this, um, I can see that this is a HTTP2 request, so it's a gRPC request. And then here is the proto buff that was sent in uh, that was causing this request to be solved. Uh, so we can use that for, uh, for debugging. Um, if this is in Go or Java or C++ and a few other languages, um, you click in on the pod 
you can actually get uh, pretty detailed information like the flame graph. So if you dig in over here, you can go in and see where in the pod um, CPU time is being spent. Um, so if you're you know, familiar with flame graphs, basically the wider the, the box, the more time is being spent. Uh, honestly, this pod is pretty idle, so you're not seeing a lot of activity, but if it was very active, we'll see a bunch of horizontal bars that are, that are very, very wide. Um, we also give you other information like, oh, how much network throughput does this particular pod, um, pod have in and out? Um, so the only one I'm going to point out is all of this is basically done by a script. So you can probably see up here that there's scripts changing with different arguments. Uh, so there's a little Python script that goes on like grabs this data and, and captures it. Um, and it's like an open repository of scripts that you can submit to on our GitHub, or you can even have like private scripts if uh, you don't want to share them with others. Uh, but as soon as you create a script, sorry, this thing's getting in my way. Okay, as soon as you create a script uh, and it's in our GitHub, like in a little bit, and it'll, you, you'll, if you pull the latest version, uh, you'll be able to see the, the script pop up over here. Um, so one of the quick things I'm going to share is some new feature here, which is a Kafka stuff. So if you're interested in Kafka, if you go to PX Kafka overview, uh, we can basically scan the entire cluster across all new spaces and say, oh, look, we see some Kafka traffic. Um, this is kind of a toy application. So you can see that there is a producer talking to the order service, uh, which then talks to consumer shipping and consumer invoicing. So you're basically seeing the um, you're basically seeing all the, the Kafka traffic flow through. Um, you can then go into like specific information about you know topics and broker pods and, and actual data that's flowing through the Kafka uh, Kafka cluster. Um, for example, you can actually see like here is a published topic and here is the destination and then the actual uh, actual data that we're seeing for Kafka. So we, we capture a fair amount of very detailed information. Uh, here is something that was produced. Um, so we, we basically will cop, capture all of the Kafka information and put this in here. Uh, what else can I show you? Oh, I don't think this one's instrumented yet. Uh, but if you have the right topics, you can actually take a look at things like producer consumer lag. Um, so if you enter in the topics, we'll be able to tell you what is the producer consumer lag between different, different Kafka instances. Um, in terms of Java, that was the last thing I wanted to point out. Um, so actually, I think it's in our Kafka demo. So if I pull up a, a service that's using uh, Java, like the orders service over here, um, and uh, let me pick, oh, I'm actually in the right pod. If I go over here, you can see that we're actually pulling in the flame graphs from you know, the actual Java process. Um, so this is, you know, one of the things that was actually a uh, fair amount of work for us to figure out. You can read all about it on our blog um, and our docs. But basically, um, we instrument the JVM stuff and now through eBPF to be able to capture um, all of the, you know, actual Java flame graphs. So typically a lot of eBPF stuff is done with native code. Um, and this is like our first attempt at doing it in like a VM-based environment. Um, cool. Uh, actually, the last thing I'll point out uh, for folks that are not familiar is that we also have the ability to write custom eBPF probes. So, for example, there's a custom script over here um, uh, called TCP drops. So, this one right here is a, uh, is a BPF trace script, and you can deploy this across the cluster and then process it using some pixels. Um, and once I run over here, what you'll see is that we're not going to deploy the EBPF probe across the cluster. And then um, it's going to take a few seconds to capture data. And then now you can see like all the TCP drops that are happening across the entire uh, entire cluster. So it's pretty easy for us to embed new BPF scripts and pull the data into Um Yeah, I think that's about all that I had. Um, you know, we support other protocols like Postgres and HTTP in fair amounts of detail, but we have given updates on that earlier. Um, what's coming soon? Um, 
right now we're pretty actively working on open telemetry export. Um, we're actively working on this thing called um, Pixie plugins. So Pixie only does data storage for a short period of time, um, you know, usually like a few hours. Um, so with the Pixie plugin support, we'll be able to basically allow us to plug in a different backend. Uh, like Prometheus or Timescale or something, or commercial systems to be able to increase their data storage requirements uh, and also do things like alerting. Um, then we're adding support for script versioning. And then the last one is the governance item. We're trying to get more and more into like the public board meetings and governance process, um, hopefully, on our way to becoming an integrated project on um, CNCF. Um, that's, all, that's all we have. If you have any questions for, for Michelle and myself, like, we'd be happy to, to take them. Yeah, thank you. There, there's two already uh, that we could start with uh, in the doc, but any uh, folks feel free to free to jump in. I think Ken had the first one. Yeah, I, I think you answered that, but in after I wrote down the question, but it was basically for Java flame graphs. Um, are you util utilizing the data from JFR to build those flame graphs, or I think you mentioned you actually got a special EBP EBPF process to do that. Did I hear that right? Yeah, so what we do for, for Java is that um, we basically use, so right now for the continuous profiler, uh, we basically capture all the stack traces that are running on the CPU like 100 times a second or something like that. Right, so for every CPU, we know exactly what the stack addresses are 100 times a second. Okay. Some of those might end up being in you know, a Java process. And if they're in a Java process, we have a small agent that we can selectively insert into the JVM to dump out the address to function mapping. Okay, cool. Um, cool. Um, the, the, uh, um, is there any sort of RBAC or control over who can either log into the UI and do queries, or uh, is there any kind of uh, are back around uh, who can deploy uh, trace uh, EBPF programs. Yeah, the, so there the capability is amazing. But like, if you're if you're thinking about like running a putting this into a product into an organization, you know, it, uh, I'm, I'm sure a lot of CIOs probably uh, with, with all of this have, would have some heartburn. Um, yeah, let me let me share this out. So this is our roadmap. So right now we have support for data application and what we call high security mode, which will restrict some of the features, like you're talking about like EBPS script injection and stuff that only like admins. Uh, the application will redact all the data that might have sensitive information in it. So right, you know, in the UI, you can go view HTTP requests, right? HTTP requests might have PII data in it. Um, and we have support to basically obfuscate all of that data. Um, we are working on adding support for signed scripts so that if there's a new script that's executed, we, you can set it up so that it requires an admin approval before it likes to keep that script. Um, so this is to prevent people from being able to randomly add in like, you know, you need to be a or something. Um, so you'll be able to know that this script has been verified and it's safe to execute on your system. Um, we plan to add in um, the basic RBAC and um, so we have some RBAC support, right? There's some split between what admins can do and what users can do. This RBAC support will kind of make that a little bit cleaner. Um, and then we plan to add in, um, over the next few quarters, capable level RBAC. So for every piece of information we collect, we can restrict who can access it. Uh, then there's column level RBAC, which will restrict which columns of data people can access. And then there's RBAC by entity, which will implement about next year. Um, hopefully sooner, but that will allow things like, oh, if you're in this namespace, you can access data about this namespace, but like not others. Um, so that's part of our security roadmap. I, I shared the, the, the link, this is a public document. Uh, we're still doing a better job documenting all this stuff, but we do plan to add in better, better RBAC support, um, but it's pretty limited right now. That's awesome, thanks. Does anyone else have any questions for Pixie or Zane or Michelle, rather? Okay, I guess uh, it's a quiet, oh, hello? All 
All right, I guess that's it then. Um, uh, thanks very much for, for the overview. Um, I, I should I should end with the same question I asked for, for Hubble. Uh, what's the place, best place to go to engage with the project if you have ideas uh, on how to improve it or you're interested in just joining that community? Yeah, so the best place is probably to go to our GitHub, I can point that over there. Um, PS. I'm putting the links in here, has all of our information. And then we have a pretty active blog as well, um, which has a bunch of information about how a lot of the stuff is implemented under the hood. Um, so if you're interested in that, uh, I post the links in the, um, in the Zoom chat. Great. And I'm adding all that to the notes as well. And then we also have a free Aqua Slack community. Uh, so I think you can join that on that. Is our official link? I do have a release in the Zoom chat and that are adding them to the, the doc. Or should I add them to the doc? Cool. All right. Well, then, um, thank you. For, thank you. Uh, thank you both for, for presenting. Um, it's open floor, or we could return four minutes to everyone's day. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. All right. I guess that's it. Uh, have a great day, everybody. Thank you.